pray together. God, help us to see that, your goodness. Help us to remember your faithfulness. Help us to take a look at our lives, to see the gifts of our family and friends, to see the gifts of the opportunities that you've given to us, to see the gift of your provision over the course of our life, to see the ways that we've experienced love and grace and hope and truth, the ways that you've given us a meaningful purpose. We can know who we are. We can know why we're here because of you. And that we are not defined by our sin because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. That we truly can be set free, saved, redeemed, restored because of what you have done for us. God, you are so good to us. Help us now as we step into your word. Thank you for the gift of it, for the way that your goodness is expressed through the way that you continue to speak to our lives. You help us. You help us to know how to live. You help us know what it is to love. And you remind us constantly that we are yours, that we are loved, that you are with us. So Spirit, lead us as we step into this word and as we face kind of this challenge of the temptation to complain or to live in a posture of bitterness. Father, help us to be willing to allow you to confront that within us and help grow us, change us, heal us from those places that encourage us to remain bitter, resentful, and often separated from others. So Spirit, speak, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So we started, Lent started this past, uh, the first Sunday of Lent was last Sunday. This is the second Sunday of Lent. Lent really starts on Ash Wednesday, and it's kind of the 40 days leading up to Easter. And it's a time of preparation. It's a time of reflection. It's a time where we're encouraged to kind of take a look at where we're at with God. And so we've entitled this series, Letting Go, and really encouraging all of us to consider maybe there's some things in our life that we need to let go of. So Chris kicked kicked us off last week with focusing on letting go of control and expectations. None of us have struggled with that, right? We didn't really need to cover the control and expectations, right? Right? (laughs) And today, we're going to step into letting go of complaining and bitterness. None of us have ever struggled with that either, have we? I really have always been a person that have seen myself not as a complainer. In fact, I always have felt like I've got this special sixth sense where I am so acutely aware when complaining starts to take place. And it's kind of like nails on a chalkboard for me. I just, it, the complaining piece drives me nuts. But full disclosure, guess what? I complain. And there's nobody I complain more with than who you see on the screen today. That's Leo. Leo's going to turn six in May. Nobody hears me complain more than he does. And it's every single day. And it's multiple times a day. Are you kidding me? You've got to go out again? Have you ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? I took middle school, fifth and sixth graders, to Chuck E. Cheese back in the day when I was younger and cool. And back in that day when we went to Chuck E. Cheese, I made a fatal error. And it reminds me of what happens with my dog so often. I made the fatal error of forgetting that at Chuck E. Cheese, you win tickets. And you get this pile of tickets. And then fifth and sixth graders, before we left, I gave them five minutes. But they had to make a decision about what they were going to buy with their tickets. All of the junk at Chuck E. Cheese, if you've ever seen all the different options of candy or trinkets or stuffed animals... It took them 25 minutes before all of them had finally made a decision about how to use their 37 tickets at Chuck E. Cheese. Reminds me of my dog who goes outside. And for some reason, dogs have trouble deciding where do they want to go to the bathroom. It's a whole process that takes place that's way more time than anything I've ever experienced. And so you hear me say over and over again, let's go. 
Just find somewhere. Help me, Rhonda. Lord have mercy. I mean, over and over, I hear myself complain. Complain, complain, complain. Nobody hears it more than my dog. And there's an impact, isn't there? There's an impact. None of that does me any good. None of that helps me to be more the person that I want to be. But because of my impatience, because of what's going on inside of me, of me not getting my way, out it comes. So complaining is the expression of dissatisfaction or annoyance about something. And the key thing there is the expression of. We express it when we complain. It comes out of our mouths. It comes out of our nonverbals. It's very clear when we're in that posture of complaining. But note the key piece. It's the expression of. I mean, we can all be dissatisfied. We can all be annoyed. But it doesn't mean it has to be expressed. But complaining is the expression of. Bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. Now that seems to make sense. It's okay if we don't like being treated fairly and there's an emotional response. But one of the key things about bitterness is resentment. And there's even a better definition here that I found from the Biblical Counseling Coalition. Bitterness is unresolved, and here's the key word, unforgiving anger and resentment. It is a result of anger changing from an experience, right, a moment in time, to a belief, right? We carry it with us. We hold on to it. It continues to impact us. Bitterness is seething and constant. Bitter people carry the same burdens as angry people, but to a greater extent. I mean, you and I have all experienced those moments, those times, those experiences in our life where we've been drawn to bitterness. We've been tempted to take the posture of resentment. We've put up a wall. We've brought separation into a relationship. And we feel, anytime that we see that person or remember that circumstance, those feelings come back and they come back strongly. And they hinder us from God's way of life. They hinder us from the fruits of the Spirit. And it's why this conversation is really important. Because they keep us from being faithful to who God calls us to be. And they are a reflection of an unhealthy posture toward God, which we're going to unpack for you here through Scripture. So the title of this message is Letting Go of Complaining and Bitterness. And we're going to be in Proverbs and Numbers and Philippians and Ephesians and conclude with Job. But let's start in Proverbs. I think this is such an interesting way to start this message in Scripture. It says this, the writer of Proverbs says, The sated, so the satisfied appetite, spurns honey. But to a ravenous appetite, even the bitter is sweet. So what I hear the writer of Proverbs saying is, when there is contentment and peace, we don't need more. We don't even need more of the good things. We don't even more of the sweet things. That we have contentment and peace. That we know who we are. We know why we're here. We see the goodness that God has expressed and continues to express to us. We are not looking for more. We are satisfied. We are content. But to someone who is not, to someone who is lacking contentment, lacking peace, we are so tempted and can be so drawn into even that which is bitter, even that which in the moment feels right but doesn't actually help us. I feel very justified complaining about my dog to my dog in the moment, but it doesn't do him and it doesn't do me any good. And so I want to take you through a whole chapter today of Numbers chapter 11. And it's such an interesting picture of complaining and the way that at times God has responded to that. And there's also some really helpful direction about how we navigate when we are in those places where those emotions are so strong and we're struggling with what we're experiencing. Because all of us will struggle at times with what we experience. But how do we express it? How do we express it in a way that honors God 
and honors one another. So we're going to be in the book of Numbers, chapter 11. And so the Israelites have been taken out into the wilderness. They've been out there almost a year. They've experienced being removed from Egypt, from slavery. They've seen the plagues that God brought upon the nation of Egypt to help finally the Egyptian pharaoh let the people go. They've seen the water parted as they've crossed the Red Sea, being followed by an Egyptian army. And over the course of this year, they've seen God provide for them every single day in the wilderness. He's provided water. He's provided food. He has been a pillar of fire that has led them through the wilderness. They have been aware of the presence of God throughout this whole year. Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now when the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Then the fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Now one of the interesting tidbits to grab a hold of today is that you can do some study on this if you're interested, but the camp was set up very specifically. It was set up with God being at the center of the camp, and then the 12 tribes of Israel were surrounding the camp, and they were organized in a specific way. But then there were other people that went with them from Egypt that were not Israelites. There were others that went with them, and those folks were on the outlying parts of the camp. They weren't in the center of the camp. And it's interesting that God's mad about the complaining, and some of what he does is he begins to impact the outside of the camp, which makes us wonder, is that where the complaining started? And the fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. Verse 2, but the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire abated. So that place was called Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burned against them. Verse 4, the rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. If only we had some meat. Verse 7, now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color was like the color of gum resin. The people went around and gathered it, ground it in mills, or beat it in mortars, then boiled it in pots and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. Verse 9, when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna would fall with it. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances to their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So maybe you're beginning to get some sense of God's anger. Why would he be angry? Who doesn't want meat? But part of what the Israelites, part of what this group that's out in the wilderness is not seeing is God's faithfulness, God's provision. They're not remembering what God has already done and what God continues to do to guide them and to provide for them in the midst of the wilderness. And remember, the place they had the leeks and the onions and the meat was when they were slaves, when they were under the burden of the Egyptian pharaoh, where they were being used for their labor. But yet all they're talking about is meat and leeks and onions. So no wonder God is not happy. Because they are not trusting him. Verse 11, so Moses said to the Lord, why have you treated your servant so badly? Now this is really interesting. 
Note Moses' response to what's taking place. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised an oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way, Moses says, you are going to treat me, God, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight. And do not let me see my misery. Wow. Moses is struggling too. Moses is complaining about the responsibility that he has. Moses isn't seeing a way forward. Moses is tempted in the midst of this to give up. How can you do this to be God? Why have you given this responsibility and I can't follow through on it? It would be better for me not even to be here any longer. Don't you care? It's really interesting to see God's very gentle response to Moses. But as you'll see, his response to the people is not gentle. Verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. I, God says, will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you, Moses, and put it on them, those elders, and they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourself. So God hears Moses' cries. He hears the complaining. He hears the challenges that Moses feels like he's facing, and he responds. He gathers a group of elders, and he shares the burden. He takes some of that burden off of Moses and places it on them. Verse 18, and say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord saying, if only we had meat to eat, surely it was better for us in Egypt, right? Surely it was better for us as slaves where we were controlled by another people that were using us and abusing us for our labor. Surely it was better for us to eat in Egypt. For us to be in Egypt. But God's not finished with them yet. Therefore the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not only one day or two days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? God confronts directly their complaining. and says, sure, I'm going to give you meat, but I'm going to give you meat after meat after meat after meat. Verse 21, and Moses, practical Moses, has a very legitimate question. How in the world is that possibly going to happen? Verse 21, but Moses said to the people, I said, the people I am with number 600,000 on foot. And you say, you God say, I will give them meat and they may eat for a whole month. Are there enough flocks and herds to slaughter for them? Are there enough fish in the sea to catch for them? It's a legitimate question. I look around, there's no meat. There's no possibility that there's enough meat for 600,000 people to have available to them for an entire month. The number is mind-boggling to think that that's what is needed. Verse 23, the Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. I think this is such a humbling reminding, uh, reminder, not just for Moses, 
but for all of us. As we face whatever we face, as we're experiencing some of that emotional turmoil, that wailing inside of us, as we've received the cancer diagnosis, as we don't see money in our checking account for the next few bills, as we face the potential loss of our job, as our marriage seems to be in turmoil. Is the Lord's power limited? Is the Lord's power limited? So Moses, verse 24, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent, at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. So they were impacted by the spirit of the Lord coming upon them and they prophesied. Verse 26, two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the, spirit of the, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp, right? They were elders, they were part of that 70, but they didn't make it to the tent of meeting. They're still in the camp, but yet the spirit comes upon them and they prophesy. And a young man told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. This kind of takes us back to the control and the expectations conversation from last week. Joshua is seeking to take control over what's taking place. My Lord Moses, stop them. Verse 29, but Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all of the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So we see Moses' response very different than Joshua's. The Spirit of the Lord should come on as many as possible. Whether they're in the camp or in the tent, or by the tent, doesn't matter. We celebrate in the Spirit of the Lord coming upon those folks. Verse 31, but there's still this meat thing going on. Then a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quails from the sea and let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits deep on the ground. So a cubit is a measurement, and two cubits is probably around three feet. And if you start trying to think about the math, A day's journey on this side and a day's journey on that side, so a day's journey both directions, all of these quail have fallen and are available to the people. And, you know, there's a lot of people who take Scripture very literally and have done all the mathematics to try to determine how much has actually fallen. And it's mind-boggling when you think of the number of quails that would be needed for all of these 600,000 people to have a month's worth of food. It goes on to describe what they got. Verse 32, So the people worked all that day and night, and all the next day gathering the quails. The least anyone gathered was 10 homers. And a homer is, or a homer, not an omer, those are separate. A homer is somewhere between 100 and 200 liters. So somewhere between 25, 26 to 56, 57 gallons. So somewhere, somewhere behind every person gathered about 560 gallons, or on the low side, 250, 260 gallons of quail. And they spread them out for themselves around the camp. 600,000 spreading out all of these huge amounts of quail around the camp. But the point isn't the size. Verse 33, But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So the, the place was called Kibroth Hetava because they buried the people who had the craving. Kibroth Hetava means graves of craving. 
graves of craving. From Kibroth, Hitava, the people journeyed to Hazaroth. So there's a consequence that God brings upon those who have lost their trust, who have lost the remembrance of what God has done, who have complained to him because they're not getting the meat, the onions, the leeks that they want. They're stuck with the manna, and they're sick of the manna. So God provides for them the meat more than they can possibly eat. And in that, there is a consequence. In that, there is a plague that is brought upon them. There is consequences when we choose to live outside of trusting in the Lord, of putting our faith in him, of being dependent upon him. And they've had a whole whole year's worth of being in the wilderness, watching God faithfully daily provide for them, provide where they go and provide the food and the water that they need. And so I think an important piece here to see is that complaining is often often tied to our desire to be in control. It's often tied to the fact that we don't fully trust anything beyond what we see and experience. I think this little quote's helpful. When the going gets tough, the foolish complain. When the going gets tough, it's easy to play the victim. It's easy to play the woe is me game. It's easy to get lost in the moment and not have the capacity to see the bigger picture. What has complaining ever done for you? How has it ever helped you? How has it ever helped the people you complain with? What's the impact of complaining? It's why you see this throughout Scripture. Philippians 2, Paul writes, Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you look at that. You shine like stars in the world. You stand out because of how you navigate the difficult circumstances that will inevitably come, that instead of complaining and murmuring and leading to the arguing that often comes in the midst of that, we shine like stars in this, in this world. We navigate those circumstances so differently. One of the quotes that really stood out to me comes from Peter Murphy. He wrote an article called Lamenting is Good, Complaining is Bad. He says this, Complaining is an expression of powerlessness. It discloses what unmet expectations we have. And then this sentence, it reveals an unthankful heart. No wonder God commands us to do everything without grumbling or complaining. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, Put away from you all bitterness and wrath, and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. It's part of what we experience, especially when we start talking about bitterness. It's kind of like complaining over time kind of helps that bitterness to be formed within us. And we begin to have that spirit of bitterness. We begin to kind of operate from this place that we're a victim. Woe is us. Too bad for us. And so often what that leads to is holding grudges, holding resentments against people, against others against those that from our perception have hurt us or done something they shouldn't to us. And as you probably know, bitterness is like a slow poison. Bitterness is like a cancer that continues to impact all of how we see ourselves and others and this world in our lives. You've all experienced talking to somebody who is operating from that root of bitterness, or maybe you've been in that place yourself, and you've experienced, you've seen. What does that lead to? It's like pouring out poison on others. There's nothing that good that comes from it. But I think it's so interesting what Paul says there in Ephesians about the relationship between addressing bitterness and forgiveness. 
I've used this quote before, and I'm not sure who it comes from. It's come from a, it's had a couple different names attached to it, but the quote is this, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for somebody else to get sick. Because if we choose to let that remain within us, if we hold on to the resentments and the bitterness, right, we get sick. As much as we may tell ourselves in our head, well, I'm just showing this person what they did to me was wrong and I'm making them pay by not talking to them nicely or not having any contact with them or avoiding them. We tell ourselves this false lie like we're going to hurt them by staying disconnected where they probably don't even are aware of what's churning inside of us. That's why forgiveness is so foundational to the Christian faith. How do you see that bitterness? So often that bitterness is seen in difficulty in resolving conflicts. So we avoid them or they become explosions that just hurt and hurt and hurt people and ourselves, breeding more separation. Bitterness is seen in acts of vengeance. We actually want other people to suffer and hurt. We want them to feel pain. We want them to suffer like we perceive ourselves suffering often leads to withdrawal, cut off, distance, separate ourselves, outbursts of anger. Because that poison is still in us, that cancer is still in us, that churning is still in us. And so at times it comes to the surface, and for some of us, it's like an explosion. Subtle attacks. Sometimes that bitterness, we may not be the yellers, but we're good at the passive-aggressive. We're good at shaming, guilting. Just want to make sure somebody else feels what we perceive we're feeling. Condescending communication, right? Judgmentalness, criticism, suspicion and distrust. You almost always see that within bitterness, just the lack of trust. And ultimately, and this is where I think this text in Numbers is so helpful, is what God's biggest issue is, is the lack of trust they have in him. And so often that bitterness, as much as, yes, we've been hurt by others, and we can tell ourselves a story we can't trust other people at the core, if we're unwilling to do the reconciliation work, if we're unwilling to do the work of forgiveness, ultimately we don't trust God. We don't believe that what he says is true and we sure aren't seeing what he has done for us in response to our sinfulness, in response to our rejection of him. And so distrust is present. And hypersensitivity, everything becomes a big deal. And we're acutely aware of what a big victim we are. That's why Paul you know, expresses so clearly, bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And I hope you hear that clearly, that when we are unwilling to forgive, and to do the work of forgiveness, and sometimes that is a process, not just an event, when we've really been hurt by others. It's not that we're going to forget. It's not we just like act like nothing happened. We have to do that work of forgiveness. But that forgiveness for us and being willing to do that has to be driven by that constant reminder, that constant willingness to look at God and to see the seriousness of our sin and the response of Jesus on the cross. Because we forgive just as the Lord has forgiven, you, uh, forgiven us. But what do we do with all of that churning inside of us? What do we do when we get hurt, we get wounded, and we have that emotional response? What do we do with that anger? What do we do with that pain? What do we do with that suffering? And it's, so, it's why it's so important for us to embrace the gift of lament. And you see it in Numbers 11. It's one of the right responses that Moses has. Is he brings his complaints, 
not to Aaron to talk badly about God or badly about the people that he has to lead. He takes his complaint directly to God. And yes, it's very raw. And he says some things that are maybe hard for us to hear. How dare you say that to God, Moses? But yet that's what God invites us to do. I think about wow, Job. If you know Job's story, Job had everything that mattered taken away from him. Children died. Wife died. Separated from everything that mattered. With no real clear reasoning why. And so Job's story is a story of crying out to God, of going, what in the world? And Job's friends come alongside of him and try to justify, try to explain, try to rationalize why these things have happened. And basically their response is, it's because you did something wrong, Job. It's your fault. Bad things happen because you did something wrong. But that's not the conclusion. And as you conclude the end of Job, you see you see that part of our responsibility is we're not fully going to understand all that takes place in the midst of our lives. There's not always going to be a rational explanation that makes sense to us why these things have taken place, that justifies God's behavior. There are times and circumstances in our life that it's not going to be there for us. But at the end of the day, like God said to Job, you got to trust me. I am God, you are not. My ways are beyond your understanding at times. Your response isn't to try to more deeply understand, to try to figure me out, to try to make sense of it all. Your response is to trust me. Because this is part of what Job said. I loathe my life, and I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. And here's where he gets it right. I will say to God, And you see that conversation unfold over the story of Job. And you see that his focus is primarily upon the conversation with God. And I encourage you to recognize that God invites us to that. That in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of those moments when we are so overwhelmed and it doesn't at all make sense, and there is anger and there is hurt and there is pain and there is suffering, that it is an invitation to cry out to God. And that there's something very healthy about doing that work with God. Letting him in into what's going on in your head. And especially the overwhelming feelings you're experiencing through your heart. One of the quotes that really stood out to me that helped me, I think, maybe will help you to understand why lament is so helpful for us. It says this, when Christians lament... We are expressing our suffering and at times the suffering of others because of sin in the fallen world. And there are things that we ought to cry out to God about that we see, that we experience. But unlike self-centered complaining, right, where it's all about me, it's all about my feelings, I'm the victim But unlike self-centered complaining, a godly prayer of lament shows that we know God is sovereign, God is good, God is omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, and his loving kindness is everlasting. Prayers of lament in Scripture often progress from one's current negative circumstances to a hopeful future. Read the Psalms. A third of the Psalms are prayers of lament. And you see this unfold through the psalm. From sorrow to joy, from fear to trust. Godly laments demonstrate faith and take comfort in knowing that Christ will judge sin in his way and his time. Don't miss this. Godly lament demonstrates faith. It shows that we have a trust in God. It shows that we recognize our need to turn our attention upon him in the midst of those moments that we cannot handle on our own. Prayers of lament show that our ultimate hope is that God will renew and restore all creation. That in this world, it will not be fully realized. In our lives, it will not be fully realized. But there is a day coming that is a guarantee 
that is a promise that God has made that he will fulfill, that one day all of that pain, all of that suffering, all of the woundedness and brokenness and sinfulness we see and we at times cause in this world will be gone. And we will experience the gift of God's presence with nothing, nothing, nothing separating us from him. So I want to remind you today that when we navigate those difficult stuff in our lives, we need to do so with God. I invite you to lament, to have the willingness to express what's so for you to him and to remember To not get lost completely in the moment, but in that journey through it, to do the work of remembering, right? If the Israelites were willing to take the time in the midst of their challenge of meat to remember God's faithfulness, to remember what God has done, to remember where God brought them, to remember his presence, to remember his provision, be part of the way that they would walk out of the complaining and the bitterness to remember Because in that, we are encouraged to trust. And we have to, in that trust, to be willing to continue to do the work of forgiveness. And it's out of that place where thankfulness and gratefulness, and we see so much more clearly, even in the midst of some of the incredibly difficult circumstances that we face. One of the people I was connected with at First Reformed Church in Granville passed away yesterday in his late 50s after um, a journey with cancer. And his wife just posted on Facebook just some of the story, and especially the story, the way that it reflects what I just said. How there was so much lament in that story, so much difficulty in seeing her husband suffer and seeing him navigate the challenges of cancer and the pain and suffering that that brought, not just physically, but in the anticipated loss and the separation from the things that he could no longer do. But it's such a, a post about remembering God's goodness and God's faithfulness throughout his life. And it's a post that reminds us that God is trustworthy, that even as she experiences the grief and the loss of her husband, that she trusts God. And that the post really is a reflection of the thankfulness that she feels for how God has been faithful to her in the gift of her husband. The way he's been faithful as they've navigated this journey of cancer. The way that they have seen God's provision and God's goodness expressed through their two boys. And the blessings that they've experienced throughout this life. This is the journey that God calls us to. The journey of of complaining and bitterness will take us nowhere will lead to more separation and will not help us to experience the contentment and peace that only God can offer. It is only in him and through him and with him that we experience all that God has for us. But we need to do our part. Will you pray with me, please? God, we're thankful for this word and the invitation that you give us to say what's so to you. Father, forgive us for those places where we just complain or we've allowed bitterness to take hold and there's resentments and grudges and separation that exists now in our relationships. And maybe in our relationship with you, maybe part of what's so for us today is we are holding resentments against you. And Father, I pray that you would help us to do this work, that you would help us to express what's so, to see what's true, to remember how you have been throughout human history and throughout our lives, been faithful, been present, provided, loved, served, offered hope and grace, helped us experience joy and blessed us with people throughout our lives who have been tangible evidence of your love in our life. So Father, may that help us to continue to come to that place of thankfulness. And may that spur us on to keep putting our trust in you, for you are worthy of it. Thank you again for the gift of this word. Thank you for your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
to invite you to stand if you'd like to. As we sing, Lord, I need you. Every hour, every minute of every day, Lord, we need you. So may we live into that need. It's how we were designed to live in relationship with God. Know you are loved. Know that he continues to offer grace. And know that by the power of the Spirit, you and I can live a life that glorifies him. May we do that this week. Go in peace. Amen.